One of the greatest advances in clinical dentistry in the last 30 years or so has been the development of the osseointegrated implant. And for those of you who recall back to 1985 when Dr. Brandemark released his research, the initial indications for dental implants were to anchor a full prosthesis in a completely edentulous patient. We've become pretty adept since then at not only replacing multiple teeth in a partially dentulous patient, but also in replacing a single tooth, uh, especially in the anterior aesthetic zone in healthy patients. We all know quite well now that the best way to preserve bony and soft tissue architecture after removal of a tooth is to replace the tooth immediately with an implant and, if possible, actually replace the crown with a prosthesis. The most challenging patient to do this in are patients who are losing a tooth in the anterior aesthetic zone, especially in the maxillary arch, where implant placement has to be perfect, otherwise the prosthesis will be less than ideal and aesthetics will not be so great either. And here's why these cases are so challenging. Here's a typical maxillary central incisor that needs to be extracted. And if we take a look at it, here is where the extraction socket will be once the tooth is removed. Now, it would be great if that's where we need to place the implant. However, where the implant needs to go is further palatally and more apically and angulated a little bit more vertically. And so when we attempt to do this freehand, the problem is that here's our socket. And when we start attempting to drill, we may use a, a Lindemann burr or a small round burr or something to start it. And then we're going to come in with our first osteotomy drill. And we're going to be attempting to drill this straight into the intended position and angulation and depth. And the problem is that we've got bone on one side, basically on the palatal, and air on the other, that being in the socket. And when we try to drill this, no matter how careful we are, no matter how experienced we are, that drill just tends to drift towards the apex of the extraction socket. And as a result, our first osteotomy, the one that leads the way for the ones to follow, is located too far to the facial. And then we drill our second and our third osteotomies and place the implant, and lo and behold, our implant is too far facially located also, and in fact may perforate through the buccal bone. Now, every experienced surgeon I talk to assures me that that never happens to them, but I can't tell you how many cases I've seen over the years where patients come in complaining of pain related to a maxillary central incisor implant that was placed a number of years previously. This patient's actually a dental assistant from one of my referral offices who was in a motor vehicle accident a number of years ago and suffered trauma to her maxillary anterior. She had endodontic treatment on five of her anterior teeth and everything was doing fine until tooth number seven failed. She went to a very uh, experienced surgeon in her area where she was living at the time and had tooth number seven extracted with an immediate implant placed. Uh, she was told that everything went very smoothly and things, in fact, were going quite well for approximately a year. And then she developed some tenderness over the number seven implant. Um, she uh, had some swelling and was placed on antibiotics, which helped improve the situation. But this went on for about a year and a half until she finally came to see me. Clinically, the overlying area was swollen and tender. And when we did a cone beam CT with our Galileo scanner, it was pretty obvious why she was having problems. The implant was sitting about halfway in bone and halfway out. So the threads of the implant were exposed through the buccal bone. And as a result, it was causing irritation of the overlying mucosa. Well, unfortunately, there's not much you can do for this, and so we ended up having to take the implant out, bone graft, and uh, plan to start all over again. In my practice, I don't like to leave my implant results up to chance. I use every advantage I possibly can to make sure that my implants are placed accurately and consistently in the exact spot where they need to be for the restoration. Because really, why we are placing implants is not to replace the root of the tooth, but the crown. And in order to have the prosthetic crown in the right place, the implant needs to be placed precisely. And that's why every implant in my practice is placed using Galileo's guided surgery. So to introduce my patient, he is a healthy 54-year-old man who had a history of trauma to tooth number eight approximately 10 years ago. He had ended on a treatment performed and everything was going along fine since the root canal, except that approximately two weeks before he came in to see me, he had developed some pain and tenderness in the area and a fistula with some drainage. Here's how tooth number eight looks clinically. You can see that there's some gingival recession associated with the root of the tooth, and uh, along the marginal gingiva, there is a small fistula with some purulent drainage visible. 
Looking at the image of our 3D radiograph, we can see the tooth number eight has had endodontic treatment with a post and coron crown and has got some periapical radiolucency. So putting this all together with the pain swelling and fistula, we most likely have a root fracture of tooth number eight. And so of course there's not much that we can do to try to save this tooth and so our treatment plan is to extract the tooth and we'd like to be able to replace the tooth with an immediate implant and immediate provisional restoration. A case like this really demonstrates where 3D imaging, implant planning, and guided implant surgery really shine. We want to be able to place our implant as precisely as possible to get the best overall result both aesthetically and functionally and that means getting the implant in the right place you can see here I've really been able to plan my implant placement very precisely, uh, taking into account the parallelism to the adjacent roots, making sure that I'm equally spaced between the adjacent roots, and that I'm well within the alveolus with at least two millimeters of bone on the buckle and the palatal, and that the long axis of the implant is coming out the incisal edge of the crown, since this patient's dentist would like to do the final restoration with a cement retained prosthesis. If the plan is to do a screw retained prosthesis, then we want to place the central axis of the implant to come out the cingulum area of the crown. Getting the best functional and aesthetic results with implant placement starts with removal of the tooth, and it's even more critical with an immediate implant in the anterior aesthetic zone. So in order to accomplish our extraction, we're going to be doing this using atraumatic extraction technique. This involves the use of some specific atraumatic extraction instruments, and the ones I like best are approximators and apical retention forceps. Once the tooth is out, then the next step is to thoroughly curate out the socket so that we remove all granulation tissue, infected tissue, and other debris from the socket. We begin the procedure by using a periosteal elevator on the palatal and facial aspects. Uh, in order to relieve the soft tissue. Then we're going to come in with our apical retention forcep, which we can now place sub-gingively and rotate the tooth back and forth, luxate it buccolingually, and in this case the tooth comes out very easily. We're then going to use our molt curve curette to debride out the socket as thoroughly as possible, and we can grab the loose tissue with a curved hemostat or a curved mosquito. Uh, we're going to do this uh, to get all the debris out of the socket. One of the nice things uh, about using a uh, fiber optic headlight or an LED headlight and loops is that we can really see in the socket and make sure that you've gotten everything out so that all that remains in the alveolus is good healthy bone. You'll notice on the facial where all the granulation tissue was removed that it left a defect in the buccal mucosa. Uh, we're going to go ahead and repair that as part of the procedure. Now that the tooth is out and the socket's clean, we're going to be placing our implant using guided implant surgery. As you saw, this means that we did all of our treatment planning on a 3D CT image in our Galileo software. The benefit of doing guided surgery is that we can do this case completely prosthetically driven. That means that we start with our final prosthetic result and we work backwards from there in order to determine where the implant needs to be for the final prosthesis. We send this data off in this case to Germany and a surgical guide is returned to us that's made from this data that has a sleeve in it. The surgical guides are produced by either a stereolithographic production technique or as with the Galileo surgical guide they're milled from a solid piece of material which I find to be much more stable and it has a more accurate fit. Within this surgical guide is a sleeve and that sleeve is the critical component because it controls the position, the angulation, and the depth of each drill and the implant fixture placement when utilizing a specially designed guided implant surgical kit that's specific for the implant manufacturer and implant line. The guided surgery kits can look very complicated and confusing at first, but they really all have the same basic components, and that is you've got a surgical guide that has a master sleeve in it. That's within the surgical stent. You, of course, have your drills, and then because the drills are of various diameters, you have something called a drill guide or a key or a spoon which is essentially a sleeve within a sleeve that goes into that master sleeve that controls the position, angulation, and depth of each individual drill of the specific diameter and so that key or insert or drill guide is what basically reduces down the diameter of the master sleeve for each individual drill. So now the tooth is out, we're going to place our surgical guide and a little mouth prompt to help the patient keep his jaw open and a throat pack to go behind the surgical guide to catch any water and debris. So we're going to start with our first drill. This is a 2-0 twist drill. We're using an Astra Osteospeed TXS implant. It's a straight walled implant that's 4 millimeters in diameter and 15 millimeters in length. 
So the first key reduces the diameter of the cylinder to 2.0 millimeters for the first drill and it also has a depth stop. Now we're going to switch this over and we're going to drill the second osteotomy with a 2.7 millimeter key. And notice uh, we're using a very light gentle pumping in and out action, each time going slightly deeper until we get to the depth stop on the drill. Then we're going to uh, switch to our final osteotomy which is a 3.7 millimeter diameter and again light pumping in and out action. This is a 3.7 millimeter osteotomy for a 4 millimeter diameter implant. Once the osteotomy has been prepared then we also deliver our implant through the surgical guide and so this is what we call a fully guided technique. If we would taken out the surgical guide and placed the implant freehand after doing the, oste doing the osteotomy, that would be a partially guided technique. But this is fully guided, so the implant goes through the guide itself also. And we take it all the way down to depth. Again, we're using copious irrigation. And if we need to irrigate from the side, we can to make sure that uh, we keep everything sufficiently cool. With a handpiece I stop about a half a millimeter shy and then we take the hand torque wrench to finalize implant placement. Uh, you'll notice on the implant mount there are some dots and those are timing marks that allow us to uh, set the rotational positioning of the implant. And finally we remove the implant mount and then the surgical guide itself and you can see now the implant is in place perfectly positioned. So I'm going to now place the cover screw into the implant. Notice there's a gap in the bone between the alveolus and the uh, implant itself. But the implant is stable and perfectly positioned. To fill in the space between the alveolus and the implant I'm going to use some Mineros which is a freeze-dried mineralized corticocancellus particulate bone graft and uh, we're going to mix that with some saline and pack it into place around the implant. The other thing we have to deal with is that buccal alveolar mucosal defect and so what we're going to do is we're going to place a double layer of collotape which is a collagen dressing uh, under the periosteum uh, or between the mucosa and the alveolar bone. So I'm going to take a small piece of collotape and fold it in half and then uh, Take that using a small hemostat and place that under the periosteal layer, uh, just a buckle to the alveolus. And then I'm going to pack it in place with a, a small uh, straight curved curette. Once it's in position, then we can go ahead and pack the bones. So we're packing in the uh, mineros here, and I'm just packing it with very light, gentle pressure to fill in the spaces, not pressing too hard, but making sure that I get the bone into uh, all the areas where it needs to be. Then I'm going to go ahead and trim the excess collotape. Once the collotape has been trimmed, we're going to continue to uh, pack the uh, bone graft. And we're going to use, the uh, again, the straight curette, the back side of it, um, and also uh, continue to add a little bit more bone until we uh, fill up the alveolus to the top of the implant. Uh, using the suction, we can take away the excess. We do this real carefully. And uh, here we're holding the collotape back. Uh, with this with the straight curette so that we can do some suctioning and remove the excess uh, particulate bone. Also I'm going to remove the bone using an explorer from inside the screw hole of the cover screw. And remember our plan was to do an immediate provisionalization in this case if we could and we determined in our implant planning that this was going to be a successful idea. There was good solid bone all around the implant and we could get good positioning and so we are going to go ahead and we're going to place an immediate provisional restoration. As a surgeon, the last thing I want to spend my time doing is adjusting a provisional restoration. I want it to go in and fit perfectly right from the beginning. And so what's great about guided implant surgery is it allows us to have the lab make us a prosthesis ahead of time that will go in perfectly and have minimal, if any, need for adjustment. We provide our lab with a set of study models and the surgical guide. And what they'll do is they'll take some components from the implant manufacturer that are used to set an analog into the model that we send them. They're then creating a master model which they use then to construct the provisional abutment and restoration. For this particular patient, as you see, we had the lab make a single piece abutment and prosthesis. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to clean up the area around the implant, make sure there's no bone debris in the way. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to place our provisional restoration. And what's amazing is that it goes in absolutely perfectly. We don't have to do any adjustment to it at all. Uh, sometimes we need to adjust the timing of the implant a little bit to get everything to line up properly. But as you can see here, our prosthesis goes in perfectly, which means that our implant placement was spot on perfect. 
So to recap, we placed some collagen tape into the buccal defect uh, where the fistula had been created by the infection. Uh, this was to uh, help the mucosa close and to contain the graft particles uh, of the mineros which were placed around the implant between the alveolar bone and the fixture itself. And then finally, to hold all this in place, the abutment is actually holding the graft in place. So we don't have to put any kind of barrier around the graft. The abutment itself will hold the graft particles in position. Whenever we do an immediate provisional prosthesis, we do have some requirements that help make it successful. One is that we only have light interproximal contact between the crown and the adjacent teeth. Secondly, it's completely out of occlusion. So there's no function at all on the provisional prosthesis. And the patient also is told they need to be on a soft diet for six weeks. If they can't accommodate to that, then they don't get an immediate provisional. It's also a very good idea to have a removable prosthesis as a backup appliance. Sometimes even though the planning looks good and the bone density looks great on cone beam, uh, we go ahead and place the implant and the bone may be a little softer or the implant may be quite not as stable as we were anticipating. In that case, we will elect in surgery to not immediately provisionalize. And if we have a backup removable prosthesis already available, then the patient doesn't have to leave our office with no tooth. Also, if there should be any question as far as the stability of the implant during the healing period, especially initially, uh, we can go ahead and take off the provisional restoration and we'll already have that removable prosthesis available for the patient if they need it. Finally, we're going to verify that uh, the prosthesis is completely out of occlusion. So if we look at it clinically, have the patient bring their teeth together, it does not look like there's uh, any contact on the number eight prosthesis at all. When we check with articulating paper, we see that there is a small mark on the distal marginal ridge. We're also going to take a periodontal probe and make sure that our collagen tape is in the proper position. And then we're going to go ahead and take our high speed handpiece and reduce the occlusion, uh, that one mark that was made on the distal marginal ridge of our provisional restoration. And then we're going to go ahead and check the occlusion one last time with our articulating paper. And we see that it's now completely out of occlusion. In this particular case, because of the critical nature of our implant placement, rather than taking a post-operative periapical, we did take a cone beam scan. So here you can see in the Galileo scan that our implant placement is perfectly positioned between the two adjacent roots. Uh, we've got uh, about two millimeters of bone on the buckle and on the palatal aspect, and this implant is perfectly positioned. I don't care how much experience you've had, in order to do a case like this perfectly every time, there is no other way that you can do this other than using guided surgery. Here's a post-operative clinical image of our patient at two weeks. You can see that that uh, soft tissue defect that was on the buccal aspect of the alveolus looks like it's healing well. There's no evidence of infection, and it seems to be filling in with soft tissue. We take a look at our uh, soft tissue margins, our marginal gingiva around the tooth number eight prosthesis, and we're developing nice gingival contours with no evidence of inflammation. And as you can see, the uh, number eight prosthesis is quite aesthetic and is out of occlusion. At four weeks postoperatively, the marginal gingiva and gingival contours look even better, and the soft tissue defect on the buckle is filling in quite nicely. And here we are now at four months. You can see that the soft tissue defect has healed in quite nicely. Our marginal gingiva is uh, very healthy, and we've got nice gingival contours, including in the interdental papilla areas. Taking a look at the palatal aspect, you see that we've got uh, good healthy tissue also on the palatal side. And so now this patient is ready to go to his dentist and have impressions taken for his final prosthesis.